What's up, people? It is Mental Health Monday with a spiritual twist. Brought to you by your girl, Demetra Williams Pitts. Let's get this party started. As we've already established last week, from a global perspective, the sisterhood is broken. But it can be fixed. Okay, if you missed part one, you may need to go back and review the definitions of some words that will be used in this presentation. For those who are have already caught up, remember, I left off with examples of female intrasexual competition from the Bible, Sarai and Hagar, Rachel and Leah. Now we're going to move closer to what occurs on a daily basis. Some of you may have noticed it, others may have not, especially the men. However, for those women that are honest with themselves, operate with integrity, are introspective, observant, intuitive, operate with the spirit of discernment, truthful, and truly care about the current state of our sisterhood, you'll get it, appreciate it, and check yourself. For the rest, I pray you come around, be healed, set free, turn from your manipulative, devious, and deceitful ways. Repent and come over to the side of restoration instead of being destroyers. Okay, in a scholarly article by Joy Wyckoff at the College of William and Mary Arts and Science, she says that direct aggression includes behaviors such as verbal or physical aggression and threats of harm. Indirect aggression, on the other hand, involves approaches and includes behaviors such as gossiping and social exclusion. Researchers have consistently found that men use direct aggression more than women, but sex differences in the use of indirect aggression are equivocal. Most investigators report that females use more indirect aggression than men, Whereas others have found that men and women use similar amounts of indirect aggression. Revolutionary theory predicts that women should use less direct aggression because the risk of bodily harm is more costly for females than males, as they are the primary caretakers of the offspring. Furthermore, although males may benefit from displays of direct aggression by enhancing their status, this benefit is generally of lesser value for women. Thus, Direct aggression represents a high cost and low reward strategy for women. Not only can aggression tactics be sex specific, for example, sex differences, indirect and indirect aggression, they can depend on situational factors. In psychology, the term aggression refers to a range of behaviors that can result in both physical and psychological harm to yourself others, or objects in the environment. This type of behavior centers on harming another person, either physically or mentally. Assertiveness is a social skill that relies heavily on effective communication while simultaneously respecting the thoughts and wishes of others. People are assertive clearly and respectfully communicate their wants, needs, positions, and boundaries to others. There's no question of where they stand no matter what the topic. Individuals are high in assertiveness, don't shy away from defending their points of view or goals, or from trying to influence others to see their side. They are open to both compliments and constructive criticism. Passive in psychology is depicting a character trend which is agreeable, submissive, simply impacted by exterior forces and reliant on other people. Psychology Today states how passive you are depends on your personality, your perspective, your perceptions of the world and your place in it, your feelings of empowerment and entitlement, and of course, the specifics of a given situation. Passivity can be a useful strategy and a helpful coping mechanism 
in some situations, but it can become habitual. When passivity begins to dominate our responses and interactions and determine our general approach to life, it can end up doing more harm than good. Passive aggressive is defined as a type of behavior or personality characteristics by indirect resistance to the demands of others and an avoidance of direct confrontation as in procrastinating, pouting, or misplacing important materials. Passive aggressive behavior might include avoiding direct or clear communication, evading problems, fear of intimacy or competition, making excuses, blaming others, obstructionalism, playing the victim, uh, compliance with requests, sarcasm, backhanded compliments, and hiding anger. Passive aggressive is the most destructive to the health of a relationship. It is a form of manipulation. It's indirect and dishonest. Anyone can be passive aggressive at times. As it relates to aggressive behaviors, I've witnessed some of these same behaviors and or aggressions play out on social media. Few are direct, while most are indirect. According to Marianne Fisher at St. Mary's University, women's competition is often subtle and thus difficult to quantify. Therefore, the techniques used often have to be similarly indirect and innovative, often relying on observation observations or changes in perception. Some of you may ask, what are examples of indirect or innovative aggressions? Well, let's go back to Wendy and Tabitha. We call it what Tabitha did was a clapback. Basically, what Mama used to call it is nice and nasty. Tabitha's opening retort, my God, the pain you must be feeling. Well, that's the nice part. Her tone, facial expression, soothing voice and smile. But the nasty or the bite was in her words, which could have been perceived as sarcasm. Although they were chosen very carefully, they cut like a razor blade or jabbed like an ice pick. Wendy didn't even realize she was bleeding. Yes, we're still talking about behaviors. Indirect, comp competitive, and aggression, it can happen anywhere. Another method of indirect or competitive aggression is what we call doing too much. This is when you ask a question to the general audience and someone comes along and starts the response off with, well, I do this or I do that, blah, blah, blah. The competition in this is an attempt to make oneself appear to be just as intelligent, more intelligent, savvy, or accomplished, or even as a method to indirectly cut in order to draw attention or to impress. Now, let me stop right here, because I know some of you are saying, that's not what I'm doing. Well, it may not be what you think you're doing. I'm just calling it how it may be perceived, may be perceived. Remember, we're still talking about behaviors, because that's my business. Another example of aggression or competition and competition, you're in a conversation and someone uh, points out an error. Another woman points out an error and corrects you. That part's fine. However, not only does she correct you, she'll do it more than once. Again, this is in an effort to draw attention, use derogation, possible envy or jealousy. But the bottom line is to boast themselves by highlighting their level of perceived intelligence. Baby, we saw the correction the first time. No need to repeat yourself. In the workplace, the same sort of things occur. There's always at least one person that has a position uh, that they feel they're the know-it-all, the go-to person. However, nobody's actually assigned them as that person. The issue here is if this person is in a lateral position as you or has an ear of the supervisor, it could cause an immature or ill-trained supervisor to make note of the errors in your work. This is the type of act that could potentially reveal itself on your evaluation, whereas if the person had simply mentioned the error to you directly, it could have built some camaraderie. 
What you've done now is created unwarranted suspicion, tension, and dislike. Watch your behaviors. Yes, as previously mentioned, behaviors can happen anywhere. Home, work, church, social circles, online, anywhere there are women. As mentioned in part one, the focus is typically mate selection. Or if it occurs at work, it could be brown nosing. In church, it could be a combination of mate selection and brown nosing. Therefore, the woman is attempting to gain exclusive attention from the man or whomever the selection may be. The risk is that if it's a man, either he hasn't even noticed the interaction or doesn't think it benefits him. As mentioned in part one, it's because the male brain is not designed to focus on the emotional subtleties that occur among women. Their brain operates from a different vantage point. Have you ever been out with a man and you noticed a woman eyeballing him from across the room or he engages in a conversation with a woman in your presence and you notice her body language, tone, choice of words? Later on, you ask him if he noticed and nine times out of ten, he didn't. Now, there are a few men that will pick up on the subtle indirect competitive gestures, but for the most part, they're clueless. The sly, slick, and wicked men will file that information in their memory bank and make a decision as to whether it's worth using or pursuing. Because at this point, he's already determined that miscompetition is easy prey. Girl, you just set your own self up. Now, here's what the experts say. Aggression is defined as any and I think I repeated this on, I'm repeating it again. I think I said something about that last week. But anyway, any behavior directed towards the goal of harming another living being. In their research, this definition has several important components necessary for articulating the nature of aggression as listed here. Aggression is a behavior, not a thought, idea, or attitude in contrast to hostility or anger. Aggression is intentional. Accidental harm or harm done in order to help someone would not qualify as aggression. Aggression involves intention to harm, and that harm may take various forms. Aggression is directed toward a living being. An example would be breaking a plate or throwing a chair to express general annoyance would not be aggression. However, trying to hurt your mother by breaking her prized antique plate or throwing a chair at your friend in hopes of hurting them would be considered aggression. But in the photo on the screen, was this direct or indirect aggression? The indirect aggression is in the example above involves harming someone by disrupting or damaging a real or perceived relationship for the benefit of the real or imagined catch. Another form of indirect competitive aggression involves going through another person or third party by spreading rumors or being elusive, evading, or cunning in their presence. And as mentioned earlier, relational or social aggression, which involves harming someone by disrupting or attempting to damage another person's relationship. Passive aggression is yet another form of competitive aggression. Uh, giving someone the silent treatment, showing up late, pretending to be unaware. It is noted that people would be more likely to use passive rather than direct or indirect in most circumstances. Why? Glad you asked. Because the odds of pinpointing their actions is a little more difficult. People who are intentionally cunning will go to extended levels to hide their deception both from the victim or target and the designated prey. I've witnessed this as well, but what the person does not understand is the basic principle of criminology. In order to catch a thief, you need to have the capacity to think like a thief. The things I've witnessed among women 
there will be one unsuspecting and vulnerable female that the competitor will use to gather information. We'll call them the informant. However, depending on how wise the so-called target is, will depend on how much information the informant may be able to retrieve. If the target is wise as a serpent, they'll do one of two things. One being they'll play the game for a little while until they get bored. Second thing is they'll immediately shut you down. Another thing to remember, there's always someone smarter, more experienced, with acute intuition and a level of distinct discernment more than you. Now, there is actually a breeding ground that's called network density. This is where there are multiple connections. It is noted that among older adults, this is a breeding ground for gossip and rumor spreading, which includes indirect and non-direct aggression. Researchers were surprised to find that among this group, indirect aggression was used more frequently than any other tactic. I call it a tactic because this is exactly what it is, an action or strategy carefully planned to achieve a specific end. Just because it's a strategy doesn't mean it takes a whole lot of planning. Some people are naturally strategic, depending on their goal. It's also defined as the art of disposing armed forces in order to battle and of organizing operations, especially during contact with an enemy. In most cases, the enemy is not aware of the tactic. However, the competitor is always aware of the enemy or target's arsenal. Be careful, ladies. Don't step on a landmine. You might get your toes blown off. Additionally, research showed that females reported using indirect aggression more often than direct aggression, regardless of the gender of the target of their aggression. It was additionally noted that when people are angry with a romantic partner or sibling, they are likely to confront them face to face. However, when people are angry with a friend, they are likely to avoid direct confrontation by delivery harm, by delivering harm. For instance, by spreading rumors or talking behind his or her back. The simple answer to whom do we hurt and how? Question is that the likelihood of aggression and the kind of aggression people use depends on their relationship to the person who has angered them. Like a peacock flaunting its tail, women are advertising their attractiveness when they use cosmetics. However, women can consciously apply cosmetics to make themselves look younger with smoother glowing skin, large eyes, red lips, and thereby deceive potential mates and rivals into thinking that they are more attractive than they might otherwise be. However, in the case of social media, and depending on the audience, makeup may not be the bait. In some cases, it could be the person's level of intelligence, availability, manner of speaking, writing, religious beliefs, or understanding, agreeability that is used as the peacock feathers. Research suggests that because there are many different ways to conceptualize competition, uh, they propose that competition must be seen as rivalry. When two or more individuals are in pursuit of the same reef resource being the man, and that resource being perceived to be insufficient in quantity, the individuals can be considered as being engaged in a competition. The individuals do not have to be conscious of the rivalry or be even aware of their competitors, but they must be partaking in an activity that draws them closer to attaining the desired resource. In terms of our topic, I propose that the scarce resource is perceived as a good man. As previously mentioned, these behaviors include a wide range of activities, including dressing up for a night out on the time, posting it on Facebook, telling a rival that the male is homosexual when he is not, casually making a negative comment about another woman, and calling, texting, emailing, inboxing a male frequently to ensure he is not with another woman. For example, indirect aggression among girls 
and women includes behaviors such as breaking confidence, criticizing others, clothing appearance, or personality, trying to win others to one side, shunning, excluding, excluding somebody from a group, writing nasty notes, that will be girls, or maybe a nasty post, whatever, posting ambiguous messages, then saying, oh girl, that was just an inside joke, and spreading false stories and gossip. Moreover, it seems that indirect aggression is linked to sexual readiness. As earlier onset in sexual behavior has been documented in aggressive girls and women. You ready, girl? Something women should know. When considering women for relationships of various durations, Men place more importance on female attractiveness as the expected duration increases. In other words, men have lower standards for a woman's attractiveness when seeking a mate for a one-night stand as opposed to study, dating, or marriage. Subsequently, perhaps not the form, but instead the quantity of competition changes in parallel to the length of the relationship. However, studies also showed that women who view the attractive woman reported significantly more jealousy, anger, and sadness than women exposed to the unattractive woman. Another study showed women 20 images of either attractive or unattractive women and measured their self-perceived physical attractiveness. Exposure to attractive rivals resulted in lower self-rated attractiveness, whereas exposure to unattractive rivals resulted in higher self-rated attractiveness. These studies provide support that women's self-perceived attractiveness, a significant predator of mate value, fluctuates based on perceived market demands relative to mate value. According to an article by Sophia Reed in Relationships for Singles, she states that competing another woman for a man is stupid. And here are her reasons for saying so. One, you think you're competing with the other woman you could be competing with another man or the man's goals. You think one of you will be the winner. He is probably having sex with everyone. All women lose in this situation. If he's not sure about you, why be sure about him? If you're not his everything, you need to be his nothing. You can do bad all by yourself. You don't need his drama, meaning the competition, the, the competitiveness. You don't want to win by default. Why would you want to win a no good man just because you were silly enough to sit around, wait long enough, and be the least likely woman to tire of his nonsense? Lastly, the only winner is the man. It is imperative that I tell you about one more female interest sexual competition in the Bible. Although there is not much known about these two women, what is known is that Paul thought it important enough to mention in Philippians, the fourth chapter. Most have probably ignored this passage of scripture due to our unwillingness to properly study and search the scriptures as the Bereans psychological manipulation, illiteracy, laziness, sensationalism, illusionary truth, cognitive dissonance, and entertainment has prevented us from seeing a lot of things that are in God's word. These two women are, and I'm going to give them different names, but they're, I'm going to call them Eunice and Sissy, noted as two leaders in the Philippian church. Their fighting threatened to undermine the entire unity of the church. Paul says, now I appeal to Eunice and Sissy. Please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, 
I'm going to call him Gus, uh, which is a companion and yoke fellow, to help these two women. For they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. Sidebar, Paul asked one of the church leaders to speak to them both and to help them to overcome their difficulties. Paul refers to the leader by the Greek name of, I'm going to spell it S-U-Z-U-G-O-S, and I'm going to call him Gus translated to mean someone who helps other people with their difficulties. If that was his actual name, then it was a good choice that he really was the special person assigned by God to help in these situations. Verse 4 says, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Verse 6 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Verse 7, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. That was the NLT version. According to Sharon Hood Miller, author of an article in womenleaders.com, Live Your Calling, states that rather than respectfully disagreeing, I've noticed mature women in Christ choose to belittle women who take a different position than theirs. This behavior is wrong. It is not Christ-like. And as women of the church, we need to be better than that. Throughout history, tremendous destruction has resulted from rifts between women. So we need to take this problem very seriously. There is something about the female heart that seems especially prone to attack women with whom we disagree or feel jealous, and that is nothing but sin. God is not glorified by the ugliness of pot shots and gossip, but Satan revels in it. Clefro Dollar states, Take the powerful drive of competitiveness, combine it with the volatile poison of jealousy, and you have a lethal combination. But competitive jealousy is more than an emotion. It's a spirit. The objective of this very subtle spirit is to deceive you and keep you from reaching your full potential in God. It will stop you from being all that God has designed you to be. He goes on to say, who knows how much depression among women in this country is caused by trying to compete with the false images of Madison Avenue? It is not, not God's will for you to get caught up in a devastating quest to measure up to phony standards of perfection. These are not God's standards. The spirit of competitive jealousy is subtle, but very active enemy of the people of God. It will provoke a person to compete for favor, position, authority, and influence. This unnecessary competition sidetracks us from seeking the true goals God desires for us to achieve. Competitive jealousy causes us to lower our standards. Competitive jealousy originates with spiritual forces in high places. It is estimated that 17.3 million adults in the United States had at least one major depressive episode. It is additionally noted that 10% of that 17.3 million are women. So ask yourself, do you want to be held accountable or guilty for an active participant or an active participant in causing my sister to suffer from depression or anxiety? So as I close, remember ladies, these things as we interact with one another, train your mind to always consider your actions because they have, can, and will continue to cause harm to others, which makes you an aggressor, bully, and a hypocrite. Mind your behaviors. And one last thing, is it really worth risking what God has for you? Ah, look. Oh!
Oopsie. There was one more thing. If you're a non-believer, I'd like to offer Christ to you, for you are not exempt from struggling through life, trying to figure out why you keep running into a brick wall, why you're uncomfortable in your own skin, why life seems to be constant and, cons and a consistent battle. Come to know Christ, learn of him, so that you can live in a content and peaceful state of mind while everything else around you seems to be falling apart. Believing in Christ is salvation, and with salvation comes the Holy Spirit, and with the Holy Spirit comes an internal navigation system. But just like the navigation system in your car or on your phone, you have to enter information in order to get the right directions to your destination. Entering the right information is called prayer. The difference between your car or phone system, you'll only get one set of directions. If you go off the path, rerouting will kick in. That's okay. The Holy Spirit will lead you back to the one and only path. If you desire to be in Christ, simply repeat these words, then connect with someone to help you learn of him. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I believe you are the Son of God. I confess my sins and willingly turn away from my wicked ways. I accept you as my Lord and Savior and humbly receive the Holy Spirit in my life today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Bye-bye. <laughs>